So welcome to our talk on South Sudan and the, the history. So today is the, um, the 10th anniversary of the referendum of South Sudan. It is January 9th, 2021. And 10 years ago, South Sudan had the opportunity, um, or the, the people of South Sudan had the opportunity to vote for their independence and become the youngest nation in the world. And I had the, the very great honor of, of being present for that. I, I lived there for the two years before that date. And, um, and so I'm, I'm just excited to get to tell you the, a little bit of the story of South Sudan tonight. So um, we're going to be posting this online. And for those of you that are, um, that are joining us, we're so happy that you're here to be a part of the discussion. And I look forward to seeing your questions and, um, and having, having a good talk. So I wanted to start with, with just a few pictures to, uh, to give you an idea in, in case you're not sure um, where it is that South Sudan is. Um, so this is, this is when the country of, of Sudan, the Republic of Sudan, which included North and South was still a United country prior to 10 years ago. And um, it was at the time you can tell um, slightly by this picture, it was the largest country on the continent of Africa. Oops, wrong way. Um, and so this is the uh, this is the border now between the two countries. So South Sudan um, is is a very large country. It's as large as um, Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania put together, I believe. And it's also it also has some of the most remote places in terms of um, uh, untouched wildlife areas and, and things like that. Um, places that are very very difficult to get to and, and large quantities of wildlife. So I wanted to give you just a picture of, of the incredible diversity of landscape that you, that you can see in South Sudan. Um, but, but starting with this, with this billboard, welcome to Africa's youngest nation. So there are mountainous regions to the far south of the country. This is looking, looking across the Nile River, which Juba, the capital city is, is planted on. There's savanna grasslands in the northern part of the country. Dense jungle, um, even rainforest jungle in the west. Um, and then this is the Nile River. It, it's, a, it's, as you know, I'm sure from, from other photos, uh, an in, uh, enormous and incredibly beautiful and important river. And this is again, the mountains in the south of the country. Sudan has, South Sudan has the largest seasonal swamp in the world called the Sud. And that's, we'll, we'll pick that, uh, we'll pick that up again um, in just a little bit. So I wanted to, to just start um, with that to give you, give you an idea of, of what some of the landscape there looks like. So South Sudan and, and North Sudan um, are, having been separated for, for just, you know, these last 10 years um, are also not, not areas that necessarily had a lot in common. So the northern part of Sudan, which is now just called Sudan, is a much more arid place um, and it's Arabic speaking. In the south, many people are also Arabic speaking because of the connection between the two countries for so long, but the official language of South Sudan is English. And um, the way that the borders were drawn of these two countries initially was during the colonial time. And so the borders cut right through different um, areas that, so you'll have a, a people group, an ethnic group, which is split right in half by a border. So you've got people on, in two different countries that, that share the same language and culture and traditions and history. Um, so, so it's a really interesting place as you get towards the borders of, of Sudan. It's an incredibly diverse country full of um, I think more than 150 languages and uh, just rich tradition and, and diversity, as you saw from the photos, diversity of landscape, but also just incredible diversity of people. But I wanted to, to start with just a, a quick look back in history, because I think oftentimes our, our ancient history in school focuses on Europe, at least mine did. And I didn't learn a lot about the ancient history in, um, in Africa. And, and I came across a National Geographic article. Um, it had on the cover, and this was, this was must have been almost 20 years ago now. Um, and it had a uh, an African pharaoh of Egypt. Um, and and I looked at it and I thought, wait, I didn't know there were African pharaohs. <laughs> and I opened it up and and learned that uh, that that Sudan had actually conquered Egypt in ancient times. 
Um, there had been a lot of back and forth, uh, the kingdom or the, the area that time in the north was referred to as Nubia. And, um, and Nubia and Egypt had a lot of back and forth during the ancient period of, of conquering. And the Nubians took on the ancient Egyptian religion. And uh, when Egypt divided from upper and lower Egypt um, split and there was a lot of division and, and the worship of their, of their gods was declining, um, Sudan actually came in, Nubia came in and conquered Egypt, reunited the kingdoms and there were Nubian pharaohs for an entire dynasty in ancient Egypt who ruled Egypt and, and, and really brought back a lot of its, its former glory. And so they took that, that practice of building pyramids and also of hieroglyphics, using hieroglyphics um, to, to write down their own language at the time. Um, and there were pyramids being built in Sudan, actually, um, right up um, much, in, in fact, over hundreds and hundreds of years after um, pyramids had stopped being built in, in Egypt. Uh, which is really interesting. And, and a lot of those pyramids are, are still around. You can, you can Google search some images. Um, they have a different design. They're much steeper and smaller, um, but those, those pyramids exist in, in the Northern part of the country um, to this day. So in, um, in the year 30 AD, um, Caesar Augustus conquered Egypt. And that, um, you know, you might have learned about that in your history books, um, but six years later, he tried to conquer Nubia and failed. Um, so, so Nubia was a kingdom which, which limited the extent that the Roman Empire was able, able to spread. And in most of the other parts of the world um, that were at the edge of the Roman Empire, these were um, kingdoms and, and countries which had to pay tribute to Rome. Um, so they were, there was some, um, conflict uh, between them or they had kind of settled and they had to had to sort of pay homage to Rome. That was not the case with Nubia because they literally defeated Rome. So um, they chased back the army. They, uh, they, they managed to capture a, a sculpture of Caesar and um, they cut the head off of the sculpture and they planted it in the, in the walkway of the palace um, so that people had to walk over Caesar's head in order to get into their palace in Nubia. And the interesting and really amazing part of the story is that, that that army was led by a woman who was a general and a queen mother of Nubia. So they had a, a matrilineal way of, of passing down the crown. So usually it was a king who ruled, um, but it was always uh, his sister's son would be the next king. So the, so the line passed through, through women. And, um, and if, the, if her son was too young to rule or something happened to him that she would take on role. So there were a number of queens who ruled Nubia and, um, and who were incredibly powerful at the time. So, so this, this one queen who had, um, was very, she had lost an eye in battle. She was an incredible archer and, and the army was, were, were incredible archers. They were able to shoot through the eye holes in the armor of the Romans as they, as they um, tried to take over and, and so they failed. And so this was a, was a really mighty and um, an important empire in, in the region. And it was the reason why a lot uh, was not known about further south in Africa um, during that time by Europeans and by those who lived in the Middle East because they couldn't get past Nubia, essentially. <laughs> they they couldn't, couldn't get through to, to learn more about what was happening um, lower down. So, um, so we have some stories from the Bible, which, which mention Cush. So Cush is also another name for, um, for this, this area of the world. And uh, one of Moses' second wife comes from this area. She comes from Cush. So that's a mention in the Bible. And then also the Ethiopian eunuch that Philip meets. If you remember that story, when he, um, he comes along a chariot that's going along the road, he, he feels called to chase after it. And and he finds that, that this eunuch is, is studying the scriptures. Well, it says that, that he, is, is, um, he works for the uh, Queen Candace, which is an inappropriate translation. Kandake is, is the official um, title that these queens of Nubia held and, or of Cush. And so, um, so this, is, this is a scriptural reference to a servant of the queen who is uh, converted to Christianity. And um, that would have been around the time of... Um, you know, sh shortly into the first century when, when that occurred. Um, and so we, it, it's interesting, kind of common knowledge says Christianity didn't come to Africa until the missionaries of the 17 and 1800s. Um, and that is just absolutely plainly false. Um, and I, I was shocked to, to learn this story when I, when I first learned it, but, um, but Christianity spread into Africa from the very beginning. So certainly from that 
that story of Philip um, shows that, that even when the Gospels were being written down, and when the Acts of the Apostles was, was being written down, that, that people knew the importance of the Christianity that was taking hold in Africa already. And so it, it grows, it grows primarily, um, archeological evidence shows among the poor in the country of Sudan at that time. And you see um, ancient churches start to spring up. So it was likely that, uh, that traders coming from Egypt were bringing the, the, the new, brand new Christian faith along. And uh, around, um, around 300 and, let's see, I wrote down some dates here so, to make sure that I, wouldn't miss, misspeak, um, but they, uh, the, the queen, so the royal family officially adopts Christianity and become, and it becomes a Christian nation. Uh, and there, there were three kingdoms then that split up. Each, each one of them in this, in this area were, were Christian kingdoms. And so not only the monarchy, but, but the vast majority of the people in the kingdoms were, were also followers of Christianity. Um, and that those Christian kingdoms lasted for over 1,200 years. So Christianity uh, was was very deeply a part of the culture and of the experience of the people. And just like they resisted um, the Roman Empire coming in, there was a lot of conquering that was happening from uh, from Muslim empires that that were starting up. And uh, Sudan continued to maintain its independence and uh, maintain its its status as as Christian kingdoms. Um, through until about 1500. So, so there were hundreds of years where there was warring along the borders. Um, and it wasn't until there were intermarriage between, um, between Christians and Muslims um, that, that that diversity of religion started to, started to spring up in Sudan and eventually um, uh, became the, the predominant religion. So it, it's interesting because that the story isn't usually, isn't usually told that way. Um, and because this is so long ago, oftentimes people have forgotten, but there are still vestiges of that in, in the local tribal culture. So for instance, um, there's a headdress of a certain ethnic group that has a coin on the forehead, and that was for um, the head tax, which is what Christians had to pay um, around the time when, uh, when some of the rulers began to convert to, to Islam. Um, they had to pay an extra tax for maintaining their religion. And so, um, so those coins and the headdresses um, exist to this day, but are, but are part of that more ancient tradition. Um, there's also, uh, you'll find even in, even in the Muslim areas in the North, um, that some places will use a cross as a sign. Um, it's considered a local it's ancient sign to, to rid a place of evil. And so you'll see it painted on, on buildings. And um, it's not meant to be a Christian cross, um, but that use of the cross to ward off evil uh, goes right back to this to this ancient Christianity that that was there before, um, which is which is just fascinating to me. So, um, so missionaries did come to Sudan. Uh, they came from from Egypt. So um, I'm, I'm missing a few steps though. So so the these these Christian kingdoms uh, became converted. They they split into smaller kingdoms and eventually um, were were taken over by um, by various different groups. The whole area was taken over by the Ottoman Empire, and um, and they ruled for for a brief time. Uh, they took over Egypt as well, and then um, Egypt and Britain together had an arrangement to rule Sudan. And the reason that they were interested in Sudan is because uh, a good portion of the Nile flows through. The Nile, of course, is the most important thing to Egypt. It's it's all of its water for agriculture for everything. And so if, um, if Sudan were to become developed, they thought back in colonial times and use the water up before it got to Egypt, Egypt would, would crumble. And so there were very strict um, rules that were put in place and the interest of the colonial powers in, in their presence in Sudan was, was not to develop the country, but specifically to keep it underdeveloped so that the control of the water would, would remain flowing to the South. Um, so they, they prohibited missionaries from teaching people how to read because they were afraid that the local people, if they learned how to read, would, would rise up against their oppressors. And this is really where the division between North and South begins in Sudan to become um, much, more, uh, much more difficult because uh, the, the British believed that the Northerners who were more Arab in their appearance were uh, more able to learn. And so they invested in universities and in infrastructure in the Northern part of the country. Um, but they specifically did not inv invest in any infrastructure in the South. So 
in 2008, when I first went to South Sudan, there was um, a, two kilometers of pavement in the entire country. Um, and there were some old, very old colonial buildings that were maybe one or two stories, um, but, but really no infrastructure left behind from, from an earlier time. Whereas in Sudan, in the North, in Khartoum, is a huge city with lots of infrastructure dating back hundreds of years. Um, so, so there was a real different treatment of, of the two places. So the North realized that, that there were a lot of resources also to be gained in the South. So after, um, after the colonial uh, period ended in, um, in the 19, 1950s, I believe, um, it was a united country, but it was very much um, the, the Northern power structure sought to continue to, to have control over the South and, um, and what it was that the South was producing in terms of natural resources. So you can imagine that that was a really difficult um, national relationship but between the two countries. So Northern traders would come down into Sudan. Um, sometimes they would take people by force and make them slaves and bring them back to the North. Uh, so there was a real deep animosity um, that existed uh, between the groups. Now, I do want to I do want to say that this is like a really brief overview. And I read this really long book about Sudan before I before I moved there in, in 2008, because I was really interested in the history. Um, and the longer that I lived in Sudan, the more that I realized how little I knew. It, it was sort of like uh, with each week that passed, I knew less and less. <laughs> it's, it's just an incredibly, incredibly complex story of, of different um, especially in terms of the politics, in terms of, of the ebbing and flowing of, of different things. Um, but there was a, um, there was a, a dictator that, that rose up in the, in the 60s and 70s who was at first um, more on the socialism scale and, and nationalized a lot of companies. And, um, but he was, he, was not, he was not very into religion. And then he was converted by uh, by someone to become a much more extremist um, in, in his religious views. So at that time, Sudan was almost entirely Muslim in the north. The south had a, had a good number of Christians, but also a number of Muslims as well. And, um, and yet in, in the north, the, the practice of religion was very much um, mystical, the mystical wing of, of Islam. Um, you, if you've heard of the whirling dervishes, those are, those are from Sudan. Um, and that, that practice rather of prayer is from Sudan. So it's, it's spinning and, and, and twirling around um, at, such a, at such a pace to, to enter a state of, of meditation or, or meditative prayer. Um, and so it, it was very strange to have this extremist religious view represented from the top of government. And unfortunately that took hold, um, never, never widespread among the people of Sudan, but certainly among the dictators who, who held power in the North. And they, um, there was a few people who, who saw it as an opportunity to, to really gain power and, um, and do some really terrible things. So, so there's, some, there's a, a man who, um, who really was kind of the, I think in the 80s, he called together a group uh, to, to teach them terrorist tactics. And Osama bin Laden was one of the people that he trained and, and gave money to help set up one of his, his first training camps. So, um, so, so that kind of real um, dangerous, violent extremism, which was completely separate from, from, the, from the religion that was being practiced by the people, was able to take hold because the people at the top were, um, were seeing it as, as a way of, of gaining more power. So as you can imagine, as, as this kind of religious extremism is taking over um, the, the levels of government in terms of, of the dictator and, and those that are working for him, um, that causes even more animosity with the South because the people then begin to become oppressed who are practicing Christianity. And there is um, widespread effort to try to stop people from their practice of Christianity and, um, and to, um, well, just, just general oppression as well as taking of natural resources. Um, so there's, there's deep, deep divide and pain in the country and, um, and war breaks out. And there, there's a brief... Um, there, there's a lot of back and forth that happens um, in the war. So it, it's really almost 50 years of war. Um, but, the, but the last part of the war starts in 1983. And that's when the South really has this idea of um, autonomy, where they want to become their own nation. Um, they have this dream. They feel like they're, they're at this point is it, so much animosity and so much difference between the North and the South that there's not really a way to, to continue together. 
But interestingly, the leader of that revolution, whose name was John Gring, um, he, he's very much the, the George Washington figure of South Sudan. Um, he was incredibly eloquent. He uh, studied at university in Iowa, I believe, somewhere in the, in the US, but I think it was Iowa. Um, and from his time in the US, he said, you know, in the US, they have a lot of different um, tribes, if you will, a lot of different ethnic groups that are able to live together in peace. Um, I think we can do the same in South Sudan. I think that we can forge a way forward of, of democracy and that, that we can live together and we can, we can um, have self-determination. Um, and, and so they, they had a really difficult war. Um, there was a lot of infighting that happened at one point, a whole section of, of the South was paid off by the North to, to turn their forces around and fight against the South. Um, and it wasn't until the late nineties that John Gring was really able to reunite the, the forces of, of all these different ethnic groups that were fighting in the South under a, a common theme. Um, and they were, able, they were able to prevail. Um, part of that was actually a lot of pressure that came from the churches. So throughout this period of time during the war, the churches in Sudan, which at this point are, are completely autonomous, self-governed churches, uh, they're the ones that are providing schools and clinics and um, continuing to teach people and, and care for them and, and gather together and worship throughout the war. So after such a long period of war, um, th there's no government infrastructure ever in the South to be able to really fully do that. Um, and so the church takes on that role. Um, and the church is the one that's the most connected to, to the people. Um, and the Episcopal Church in South Sudan is, is quite large, is much larger than the Episcopal Church in the United States, um, second only to the Catholic Church in, in, um, in South Sudan. And so those two groups represent the vast majority of Christians um, in the country, so millions and millions of people. So, um, so they put a lot of pressure on um, the international government and or the international governments to come together and, and help to, to secure a peace. And the peace was signed in 2005. And it was just, it was an amazing thing because it really signaled that, um, that South Sudan was gonna, they had won the war essentially, and they were gonna be able to vote for their independence um, in, in just a few years time. And unfortunately, John Garang just days after signing this, uh, this peace agreement, which he had spent um, you know, so much of his life dedicated to, died in, in, in a plane crash, which um, was supposedly weather. But of course, you know, many people have, have different theories about what actually happened, but it was just a few days after signing the peace agreement. So it was incredibly difficult for the country because they had lost um, this person who was so much the heart behind um, the movement itself. And uh, the man who replaced him was the vice president who's currently the president still, Salva Kiir, and who, um, well, he certainly doesn't have the charisma that John Garang had. I would just say his speeches are very long. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, he also um, contributed then to, to the second civil war um, with, his, with the way that, that he behaved. And I'll talk a, a little bit about that later um, if you're interested. But um, so I arrived in South Sudan in 2008. So it was during this period of time, which was the, uh, the Comprehen Comprehensive Peace Agreement uh, so it was not a country, it was a semi-autonomous region. So there were some ways in which um, Sudan, the government of Sudan still had a presence in the South and there were other ways in which the new government was being formed. So it was just an absolutely fascinating time to be in a place as, um, as a country really began to just build up all of the, the, the trappings of government. So I'm, I'm going to, to show you some pictures now of, of what Juba looked like and what some of that and what my life was like and all those kinds of things. But I wanted to just give, give a pause and see if, if you have any questions about all of this um, kind of ancient history of, of Sudan. Is there a timeline someplace that we could find? I love timelines. Yes, I, I made a timeline. So I, I will oh. I'll email it to you, Virginia. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Because it I'd seems like you're that. covering a long period of time. And yes, thousands complex. of years. Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah. that's fascinating, the fact that, I mean, we always think about it being new, a new story. And I yeah, mean, yeah. African story being mm -hmm. more current and, and not going back. That's been recorded, that, especially for Christianity. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Um, a question, question for uh, Jan. Yeah, hi, hi, Robin. Uh, currently, what's the uh, relationship with South Sudan with the UK and the US? 
Um, so so there, there's been a number of sanctions put in place because of the, the second civil war. So the, the, um, the country was had its independence in 2011 and then a civil war began in 2013 which uh, was largely the fault, uh, well, was the fault of the president and vice president who, who began to, um, to fight with each other. And uh, so, so we, we definitely have diplomatic relationships, but I, I know that there's been a number of, of economic strings pulled and whatnot to try to, um, to, try to influence the, the peace. Um, and, and the same, same with the UK. Uh -huh. and, and but, but both countries people... actually were, were part of the international pressure to, to form the CPA back in 2005 as well. And if, if I may, uh, why did you go to Sudan and, and who sponsored your, your time there? Great question. Yes. So, uh, so I, was a, I was a missionary of the Episcopal Church. So obviously being the Episcopal Church here um, and the Episcopal Church in Sudan being as large as it is um, had, had a relationship and, and connection between the two and they requested um, once the once the comprehensive peace agreement was in place and it was clear that foreigners could travel into the area, um, they were they had a real interest of of improving and increasing their agricultural um, abilities because a, as you as you might imagine during war and especially such a protracted war, agricultural knowledge there's an, an interruption and um, people are just doing the very basic agricultural practices that they can to to um, to get food. And, uh, and a lot of knowledge is, has been lost. And so, um, so that, that was my primary goal. I was an agriculturalist. And so I worked for, for the archbishop doing, um, doing agricultural projects. And that's a great segue into, um, into showing you my, my slides again. So let me go back here. So, um, so I, I wanted to. I think I think I have a few slides here that are that are of um, some of the of the architecture um, in in different areas. Uh, so a lot of thatch and, and mud, which is um, looks fairly basic, but it's actually a very sophisticated structure that that's really good at keeping um, heat in when it's when it's warm and um, or uh, heat out when it's warm and 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 vice versa. Um, so this is what Juba looked like when I arrived in, in 2008, 2009. Um, a lot of these buildings that, that you see um, are colonial era brick buildings with, with metal roofs. Um, and, and it was really amazing to, to watch what happened because um, Juba had been completely cut off. It was, during, throughout the war, it was held by, the city itself was held by the North, um, but all around it was held by the South. So, um, so there was really no development that had happened over decades. Um, in the city, and then all at once, uh, it had become the, the the soon to be capital of a new nation. And so, um, so this is, again is is folks who are who are squatters in the city of Juba at that time. Um, by the time I left, this is what Juba looked like. So you'll you'll see a lot of the a lot of the um, temporary structures had been moved out, and some new smaller structures were were being put up. Um, this was 2012 when I went back. So just a year after independence, I went, I went back for, uh, for a visit and there were these, I couldn't believe it, you know, that all these multiple story buildings had, had sprung up uh, literally just in the period of months that I had been away. Um, and then this is a more recent picture of um, aerial photos. You can see larger buildings again, um, just springing up in, in a matter of just a few short years. Um, and and this is this is the, oh the fancy hotel in town now um, in Juba, which um, which I saw the last time I was there. I was there just three years ago. Um, so so South Sudan has just experienced an an incredible um, boomtown level of growth. Um, it was fascinating to to watch that happen. So this is this is what my house looked like, and um, I, I lived at uh, first. I lived in, in the same house with the Archbishop and his family. He was my host father, and then. Um, he moved out and, and several other missionaries moved in. So, so we, we lived together there and um, we had power most of the time, but sometimes we didn't. So we had, we had candles and um, this is our kitchen. This is my office where I spent um, time doing my work for the, so I was working for Archbishop Daniel and, um, and he was the one that had the vision of having an agriculturalist help to do agricultural assessments and then um, help start agricultural programs that would be run by the churches. So uh, this, so we had our head office in Juba, and this is um, this is Mama Phoebe, who is the office manager, 
And um, she kept that printer running and it was, it was just a godsend <laughs> to everyone who worked in the office. Uh, there were about 50 people that worked in the provincial office in, in various different, um, different ca capacities. I also taught agriculture at the local seminary. So these are some of my uh, seminary and students. They traveled from all over the country to come to, uh, to learn at the university there in, in Juba or the seminary, I should say. So um, this is also what I looked like most of the time um, <laughs> out farming. So this was one of my demonstration. This was actually um, on the compound where I lived, one of the demonstration gardens that my students helped me with. And here's my students in the garden um, during one of their uh, laboratory exercises. Um, we, we used a lot of different experimental techniques and, um, and tried different things out. I also traveled about two thirds of the time I was on the road. Um, this was a nice road. Um, this is a not so nice road. <laughs> so uh, so I, would, I would go to different places. Sometimes we would fly. Um, there are a lot of places in the country that can't be accessed by road. And, um, and one time I rode on a boat down the Nile uh, to get to a place that couldn't be accessed, which was, which was an exciting journey. So when I would get to the different places where I was going, I, I would work with, uh, with the clergy and uh, with the bishops. This is the diocesan secretary for um, the Diocese of Benzara. And we, we were looking at um, the booklets that, that I brought with me that were a, a general training in, in tropical agriculture. And I would um, talk with folks and, and figure out what it was that was going on and what the, what the hopes and goals were of the diocese and then help them to evaluate uh, the land that they had and to think through some of the projects that they, that they might like to put into place. Um, I do trainings. This is one of, one of my favorites about why you should not, uh, you should mulch instead of burn, which was, uh, which was something I, I talked about a lot. Uh, and then we would always have practical um, parts of, of the workshops so that people had a chance to, to really see and touch and, and think about what it was um, that, that we were talking about. Um, and we talk about faith as well, not, not just about agriculture, but, but why it is that it's important that we do uh, the things that we do and um, how it is that God helps us and, and teaches us. Uh, so we would, we would practice the different things. Um, and then we also had several demonstration gardens or farms. So this was a large scale demonstration farm in the far south of the country where um, I visited there at least once a month. And these were the folks that, that kept that farm running. So what they did was um, they planted, uh, so this, this is a demonstration plot of scattering. Sorghum is the, is the main crop there. So um, this is what it looks like if you scatter seed, but then you can see there's mulch on the soil covering it. Um, and then this was their um, planting in lines demonstration. So we, we were able to increase yield two or three times without any adding anything that cost money. It was literally just different planting techniques and the use of mulch instead of burning. Um, so it was really incredible um, results. And we were able to, to track with the farmers after, after trying these, these things out on our farm, um, 70 to 90% of them a year later were using these techniques, uh, which, is, which is a high, far higher um, usage rate than, than most uh, nonprofits would get um, training in that area. And we credited that to, to the faith aspect. So talking about why it is that, um, why it is that we do what we do and, and um, bringing faith into it that really made a difference. So I love to just um, go, back and, oops, go back and forth between, <laughs> between these two <laughs> pictures. And you can, it, it's really easy to see how, um, how drastic the difference was. Um, so that, that brings me to really to transformation. You can see the transformation in terms of crops, which obviously makes a huge difference in people's lives. Um, it's a difference between hunger and, um, and sickness and, and health and the ability to, um, to sell something and then invest in your children's education, invest in healthcare, invest in taxes. You know, increasing agricultural production among the poorest people in a country really brings stability to the country um, because, of, because of all of those things. So, um, the other, the other thing that, that I, uh, the other kind of transformation I wanted to talk about was um, the transformation that happened in me because I was so inspired by the people that I worked with. So um, this is on the, on the right is Bishop Alapayo and on the left is Bish Bishop Loyo. And they, um, they became two really good friends of mine. They were two of the first people that I met when I, when I went to South Sudan. And I think you can see from this photo, just, just the amazing joy um, that, that sparks out from, from their just from their faces, from, from the, um, the love of God that, that is in their hearts and, and their deep belief that, 
um, that, that the message of, of Jesus to love your enemy and to, to preach peace in the midst of a place where there is such deep division and, and so much bloodshed and difficulty was just incredibly transformative. So these two, uh, these two gentlemen come from two different, different ethnic groups, which traditionally did not get along and, and they were the best of friends and, um, and really worked through the witness of their lives and their stories to, um, to spread a, a different idea and, and a hope for the future. Um, Bishop Loya on, on the left was imprisoned during the war for uh, refusing to, to give up his Christianity and um, for a period of, I think, over a year. Um, and he also, when, when the war, the front line of the war moved at one point and, and cut off a, a group of 300 children who weren't able to get back to their family. So he took these 300 children under his wing, um, helped, helped them to, to farm so that they were, um, he was able to feed them and um, took care of them for a period of over a year before they were able to, to reunite with their families. So just two really incredible people um, living living their faith and and um the other thing about bishop loyo is is he he was constantly um he one of the most humble people i've ever met and constantly kind of um challenging gender stereotypes as well in terms of like well the women should do this and the men should do this um and he was like you should make your wife a cup of tea <laughs> you know <laughs> you shouldn't just expect her to do that for you um and things like that very respected by by so many people um, this is Archbishop Daniel, who was my host father and who I worked for, um, who was just an incredibly powerful force for peace in the country. Um, he worked with the UN and, and other groups often to, um, to, to go out and talk to warring parties and try to get them to lay down their arms and um, risking his life in the, in the process of, of doing that. Um, so, and just, just some pictures to show kind of what, what things were like in terms of um, insecurity. So this is a prayer meeting that's, that's being guarded by a soldier um, as the archbishop was traveling to, to far flung areas. Um, you would see the, the, the detritus of war left behind, broken down tanks, crashed fighter jets um, and demining through large parts of the country um, to try to make those areas uh, more safe. There was the proliferation of, of firearms was just incredible. You could. You could get um, a, a rifle like the one on, on this on this picture for um, twenty to forty dollars in the local market. Um, so so there were just guns everywhere, and, and which added to that sense of um, uncertainty in terms of what might happen. Um, but despite all of that, uh, the church the church continued doing what the church does: have meetings and make plans and um, and and move forward with with decisions and and bringing light and hope. Um, I, I was able to attend, this is the House of Bishops meeting um, because I lived in Juba um, and worked for the Archbishop. I got to attend some of these meetings and I got to be at the meeting where they decided to allow women to become bishops, which um, was amazing. There was, there was no debate actually. It, it was just sort of, well, yeah, of course women can be bishops, which uh, as you know, has, has not been the case in, in churches and in other places. Um, in South Sudan, there's an, a, a lot of women clergy so women could already be deacons and priests um, when I started there. Uh, the woman on the right in the blue shirt is a priest. Her name is Mama Elizabeth, and she also ran the, the Mother's Union, which is this incredible organization of women within the country. And I think part of why women were priests in South Sudan and, and many of the other East African countries around them, they don't allow women to be priests, is because of the experience of the war and because of the experience of the Mother's Union. So this was an organization of women who um, care not just care for each other, but um, but but visit prisons and um, bring food to those who are in need and um, train young mothers how to take care of their children and and really look for uh, the opportunities in the community. And it was clear during the war, especially as the men were out fighting, that it was the women that were keeping the church alive. Um, so it was just an obvious step for them to to begin to ordain women. Um, and I would say in, in, in parts of the country, it seemed like there were almost as many women clergy as, as men. So I mentioned before about how the church uh, had, had a lot of things going on um, in terms of clinics and schools. So here's just some of the pictures of infrastructure uh, that was built by the church in these early years of, of the peace. And obviously some of this is, is older construction as well. Um, and then sometimes uh, a building, a church, a school can, can look just like this, that the community comes together and, and builds. Uh, but of course, the most important thing is what's going on inside the buildings. And this was just an, uh, a Sunday service in the cathedral, which was right next to my house where I got to, to worship most weeks. Um, 
they would have to, uh, the ushers would have to, um, they would count the number of people in the pews and they'd make you sh scoot over <laughs> to, to make room for more people uh, to try to fit everyone in. Um, and even, you know, there's not enough room in the building. People gather at the windows to, to hear the preaching and to gather in, in the prayers. Uh, when, when I traveled with the Archbishop, if, if he was on a particular peace tour or evangelism tour, he would travel with a great number of people. And these were incredible folks who would literally, you can see the truck that they would ride in. And they called themselves the Youth Mamas. It was a, a, a group of the Mother's Union and the youth um, who together, you could see that they would have these costumes, they'd put on plays and songs and, um, and would, would travel with the archbishop and, um, and really contribute to, to the services and the, and the rallies and things that, that they would hold. Uh, and really the, the, the purpose of these rallies was to convince um, people to lay down their arms and to commit themselves to, uh, to peace and, and to following Jesus and to understand that that is what, um, what Jesus requires of us is to be first siblings in Christ before we are members of, of any ethnic group. And they were incredibly joyful um, gatherings. Um, also some very strong words uh, were, were given, um, telling the people to, to stop this behavior of, of violence and to, um, to, to move in a different direction. Um, this picture here, this, this cross that the, the woman is holding in a certain part of the country, um, uh, the, a stick, just without a cross on it was uh, was a sign of power used by um, by chiefs or leaders to to show that they had a certain um, amount of power and and so these crosses began um, something that everyone would carry who was who was a committed follower of Christ and I would see people carrying these crosses even when they're out gathering firewood they'd have the cross in their hand as a reminder um, that they were literally carrying the cross of Christ literally um, take up your cross and follow me. Um, so it's a subversion of that, that image of power, of that, that stick or scepter, if you will, of power uh, being transformed into a sign of humility that is, um, that is for all people. Um, this is, uh, this is a, a Bishop John um, in, in the Diocese of Ezo, which was at the time that I visited them, utterly displaced uh, because of violence in, in the area from the Lord's Resistance Army. And um, this was their cathedral made out of tarps that they that they gathered in um, while they were while they were displaced. And um, they asked me to come and put on agricultural workshops with them. Um, so so I did. It, it was an incredible um, experience to to get to know them and their story. So the the church the church leaders had an incredible presence in the country um, to to speak uh, to speak truth to power to to call for peace to ask for. Um, for the, the leaders of the country to, to behave in a certain way. Uh, so the, just some of the <laughs> images of that. Um, and th this was after the Civil War in 2013 started. Um, the Archbishop was called to Addis Ababa to, to um, pray with the president and vice president um, uh, during that, that peace agreement and, and was helpful in that process. So, um, the, I mentioned the president and vice president before. They, um, they tore apart the country and it was needless. And, and the churches, um, the Sudan Council of Churches, so all the different denominations together wrote, wrote a letter right at the beginning of, of the conflict saying, um, neither of you is the true father of this nation because you would rather ha see, this, um, see this nation torn apart and killed than, than, to, um, than to care for it. And they used that passage from... Uh, the story of Solomon and the two women who are arguing over the baby. If you remember that story, um, Solomon says, we'll cut the baby in half and then you can each have half. And the one woman says, no, 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 don't do that. She can have the baby. And that's how he determines who the, who the true mother is. And so they said, neither of you, you would rather see us cut in two um, than lead us. And so really strong words. Um, and, and, and to be clear, th there is not freedom of speech in South Sudan. Um, a number of journalists have been, have been killed and um, uh, it's, it's really not a place where, where it's necessarily safe to, to speak your mind in such a way, but, um, but the leaders of the church there really feel strongly um, what, their, what their place is. So that brings us, um, brings us around to voting. So, um, so in 2010, you can see this, this is one of, my, one of my students wearing his vote in April. April of 2010 was the, was the very first elections ever held 
in South Sudan um, ever, ever held in that region. And one of the bishops liked to say, he was like, since the creation of the world, we have never had a democratic election. This is the first one. And it was a difficult election. Um, you saw some of the terrain, you know, getting registration books out, getting ballots out to people. They were, they were electing every single lev level of government. So it was multiple pages in the ballot. Um, there had to be pictures because not everyone was literate. Um, it was just an incredibly complicated process. Um, and it was really, really miraculous how they succeeded in, in holding those elections um, and, and moving forward towards, uh, towards the referendum, which was 10 years ago today. And this is the Archbishop holding his registration card proudly. Um, so it, it's hard to describe the tension that existed before the referendum. Um, there was a really quick turnaround between registration and, and when the event was to happen. It seemed impossible logistically that it could happen. Um, the rains had gone on a little bit longer um, than expected. It was supposed to be dry by then. Um, there were several armed groups that were creating conflict in, in different areas. Um, and there was such pressure. Everyone wanted the referendum to happen that if it didn't happen, um, there was this real sense that, that, uh, that a war would erupt immediately. Um, and so it seemed as though January 9th, 2011, there was not, nobody made any plans after that date because nobody knew it was gonna happen. Um, it felt like the, the, the edge of a cliff. Um, and we came to that day, um, I had stock, stockpiled food and, and different things in case we had to, in case we were on house arrest for a period of time, which had happened a, a few other times. There had, been, there had been a curfew imposed and different things. Um, so, so we were prepared for the worst and, um, and it was an incredible, incredible day. Um, this is one of, the, one of the referendum voting centers in, in a rural area. Uh, and this is the one that I, that I visited in Juba. So I, I walked around um, town and, and just saw, uh, it's not part of the culture, especially in Juba to stand in lines um, and wait, that is not the culture. And so to, to see this incredibly long line and this was a quiet group of people, no one was talking. There was like incredible reverence for this moment. Everyone knew that this was their opportunity um, to vote and to, and to create a new democracy. And, um, and there was a solemnity um, it, it was almost like hushed voices. People were walking instead of driving. It was, and it's, it's really hard to describe just how kind of powerfully holy the day felt. Um, so I got to go with the archbishop. The two archbishops went together. This is the Catholic archbishop, Paulino, um, who's in, in the white outfit, and then um, Archbishop Daniel, the, the Episcopal archbishop. And they went together to, um, to encourage people and it just so happened that, um, that a certain, um, oh, sorry, here's, here's the actual voting, um, what the actual ballots looked like as, um, as he voted and, and dropped his ballot into the, into the ballot box. Um, and then a certain famous person just happened to be doing, this was not planned. <laughs> he didn't know the archbishops would be voting at this time. Um, Jimmy Carter just literally happened to wander by. Um, um, he was walking, he was not even in a car. There was a couple secret service with him. He was there to, to monitor the election, which is of course what the Carter Center does around the world to make sure it was a free and fair election. Um, and he stopped and spoke with the archbishops for, for quite some time, um, talking about his, his own faith and, and his involvement in his church. And it was, just, um, it was just the capstone on what was an absolutely remarkable day to be able to, uh, to, be able to witness that. And that is how the, uh, the youngest nation in Africa was born. And, um, and this is the, the flag of South Sudan here in the back um, being, being carried by, by a group of people. Um, that's Arch, or that's um, Bishop Nathaniel in the front of Boer. And that's the last, the last slide. I like to use that as my last slide because it's, um, it's it, it, this is a house, not a church with a cross on top of it um, and, a, and a sunrise or um, behind it, uh, which, which is just a reminder of the, um, the hope that, that I feel for, for a country, even though they were torn apart by civil war sh shortly after their birth. Um, this, is, this is a country that has been through so much and the resilience and prayerfulness and faith of the people um, make me incredibly hopeful for their future. And as we know from our own US history, uh, the beginning of a democracy is a tumultuous time. And there, there's a lot of, uh, of conflict often as, as a new government is, is put in place. So. Um, I just have a lot of hope. Um, there, there's a peace agreement in place right now that is held for, for over a year, I believe. 
Um, and then, of course, uh, you, I'm sure you saw the news in, in 2019, the, the extremist dictator in Sudan to the north was over, overthrown um, by the people. And there's a, there's a joint military civilian um, government in place currently, and they will have elections in 2022 for, uh, to replace their government, which is just an incredibly hopeful sign for them to the end of, uh, of a long era. Of, of dictators who, who, again, as I said before, did not represent the people or what it was that the people wanted. So that, that, is, that is my very <laughs> a fast forwarded version of, of a couple thousand years of history and, um, and, and hope and transformation. Um, what questions do you have? I've got a couple. <laughs> okay, um, Dick. Yeah. <clears throat> A lot of your pictures showed T-shirts and signs in English. How mm -hmm. prevalent is English in the country? So most people in South Sudan are multilingual. So they'll have um, a, a tribal or ethnic language, which, which may, may be their first language that they learn. And then um, they would have learned Arabic if they went to school before 2005 and would be fluent in Arabic. And then uh, from 2005 onwards, uh, the schools have been taught in English. So, um, so, it, so if, you, if you go to secondary school, it's taught in English. Um, so, so there's definitely, it, it's not probably the majority language yet, but it's definitely the language of government and the, and the official language of the nation. Uh, looking at a map on Google Maps, there's an area in the border between Sudan and South Sudan, it's sort of shaped like a truncated home plate. It's in dotted lines. Yes, yes. Abia, yeah. Uh, that's a, a disputed area. Um, that would would be a whole a whole nother um, <laughs> a whole nother hour. I have I have photos I was able to visit there. Um, but but the part of the reason that there was the conflict between the north and the south was the oil resources there in the in the south. And um, the oil gets pumped through the north out to the Red Sea where it's put on tanker ships and sold. So while the south was producing the oil, the north was selling the oil and would supposedly give the money back to the south. Um, so the region of Abye is, is a very oil rich region. And so in the comprehensive peace agreement, it was set up as a separate region that would have its own self-determination. Um, so that, which was just part of the kind of continuing to argue over over that that region, and so it's it has seen a lot of a lot of conflict, um, but but in South Sudan, actually, the government is is funded mostly by oil. It was the, the largest percentage of any any government in the world. I think it was like ninety seven percent of their government funding comes from oil sales. Um, so it's it's still very much a, a an important part of their economy. Sue Hill, I saw your hand up. Yes. I noticed um, when you had the picture of the people standing in line to vote, I didn't see any women. Did women vote in this election? They did. Yes, they did. They, they had separate lines for women and men so that so that women would feel more comfortable um, because the lines were so so crowded and whatnot. So um, so yes, that, that's a great, very well noticed. Mary. Was the bishop putting a thumbprint on his vote on his ballot? Is that what I saw? Um, I think I think so. I know they uh, they definitely dipped in ink to show that you voted so you couldn't vote more than once. So I think he might have been. I, I actually forget whether it whether it was I, I think you're right. Actually, I think it was a thumbprint on the on the ballot. Mm -hmm. It was a much simpler ballot after the, after the April 2010 ballot, which was pages long and had all these different people to vote for. It was it was just unity or separation. That, that was the only thing on the ballot. Any other questions? How have your ag projects uh, come along, and and what were were some of them? <laughs> that's a that's a great question. So uh, unfortunately, when the war started again, uh, the the infrastructure projects um, like the the pilot farms weren't able to continue. Um, but but the the best thing was really the training of agricultural officers. So both the clergy that that I taught at the seminary, but also um, there were officers from thirty one different dioceses that that we trained, and they went to a three month long training program, and then we were able to supply them with some basic supplies. And so they were able to then keep uh, programs going uh, during during the um, during the conflict, 
And um, actually, you, you saw those booklets that I that I had in, in one picture. So one time a person came to visit Juba and I didn't have time to meet with him because I had such a full day. And so I just handed him one of these booklets and I was like, hey, take this, you know, it's got my email address if you have any questions. Well, he was from a really, really remote part of the country. And several years later, actually, it was when I was in seminary. So just a few, few years ago, I got an email from him asking a, a really technical question about one of the uh, one of the techniques in <laughs> in this book and he had created multiple demonstration um, gardens using using these this simple booklet and um, and had taught many many people um, improved agricultural skills and so I thought that was a five minute interaction that, th that this man took and and turned into um, just an incredibly successful huge endeavor um, which I had almost nothing to do with uh, so so it's you, it's sort of, sort of the, the parable of the scattering of the seeds. You never, you never know what what's going to happen. Um, and of course, when when war breaks out um, again, it, it it makes programs very difficult to continue. What is the climate like? Is it conducive for agriculture? Very, yeah. So in, in the far south, there's two rainy seasons. In the northern part of the south, there's just one. And um, what kind of temperature are we talking about? hot very hot all the time yeah it would it would maybe as cold as it would get would be maybe 68 degrees uh -huh. that would feel cold because we, we'd be used to it being over 100 <laughs> all the time so yes incredibly hot things grow so fast and you can you can restore soils really quickly in that kind of hot humid tropics um, you can also strip them really quickly um, so the the ecosystems and soils are really fragile um, so it was really really interesting to work work in that environment Robin, in terms of church <coughs> governance, uh, <coughs> the church in South Sudan, what's its stand in within the Anglican communion? Uh, what kind of support does the Anglican communion give to the church in S South Sudan? So um, there's, I, sorry, I have to go grab my um, my power cord to, pl to plug in. But um, there there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of partnership over the years and there's still some some financial support that occurs um but but it is a definitely an independent church and so um so they part of part of the idea behind the agricultural projects was to help fund their staff costs and things like that um that, that they had as a church um, but but almost all of the clergy work without pay and um and and really suffer because of it uh, because they they don't have as much time to be able to farm and, and feed their families uh, so, so that continues to be a struggle. What were some of the crops that you had? You taught them to raise. So, uh, so I didn't. I didn't teach them to raise. Well, actually, there was one. There was one different one. So usually, um, I would just help people with the crops they were already raising. Um, so the, what what the local plants were that that people were using. Um, but there's this there's this tree called moringa, which is um, it originated in in India, and there's also a. a there's a tree that of that um, species from Africa as well. And the leaves can be treat, used to treat malnutrition. So it has about 40, if you dry the leaves and crush it to a powder, it's about 40% high quality protein. And it's got tons and tons of vitamins as well. Um, so it has an incredible health benefits. Um, it's been shown to, with a high protein uh, porridge to, to be able to, um, uh, reduce reduce numbers in, in AIDS patients, which you know continues to be an issue in Africa. Um, it, it helps reduce high blood pressure. It um, it increases uh, milk production in nursing mothers. Um, just has it kills internal parasites. I mean, it's just like there's like 50 different medicinal uses. It's an incredible tree. And I used I worked with it a lot when I lived in Liberia um, prior to moving to South Sudan. So I was really familiar with it and was delighted to find that it was already growing in South Sudan. And they would use it mostly as a, a living fence or sometimes um, would make the, use the flowers to make a tea. Um, so it was, it was a little bit easier because it was already there to be able to then teach people to use it in, in a new way. Um, but I heard from, heard from someone they were, they were still using it, um, which, which, was, which was exciting. And, and I saw a couple of trees that I planted last time I visited three years ago were, were just huge. Uh, which was exciting to see. So, do they very much meat? I didn't. I don't know that I saw any animals that. Um, it depends on. It depends entirely on what part of the country and and which ethnic group. So, there's a, a number of groups who who are primary cattle raisers. So, they would primarily uh, drink milk or milk mixed with blood from cattle and um, and meat. 
uh, and have a few, a less vegetables in their diet. But then the people that live in the west of the country are um, you have very little meat in their diet because um, but they're, they're primary agriculturalists. Did you work on infrastructure for farming or was it just improving on what was there? Like, um, so, well, the, there were a couple of pilot farms that, that the Archbishop was starting. So in those, uh, we were able to, we were able to apply for some grants and get some money for some basic improvements like fencing and um, some outbuildings and things like that. Uh, we, we got a hold of one tractor, which was a blessing and a curse. <laughs> it, it cost us a lot of money to keep it running. Um, there were very, very few tractors in the country at that time. Any other were questions? You there for? Robin. I was there for two and a half years. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. After two and a half years, Robin, what's your most meaningful memory of that time? Um, you know, I, I think it probably changes from, from day to day, like what is at the top of my head, um, because I wouldn't be a priest if it, if it weren't for the clergy, some of, some of whom I introduced you to in the slideshow, um, if it weren't for, for their witness to the gospel that just completely changed, um, completely changed my life. And, um, but, but I think one thing that, that really sticks out that I've been thinking a lot about, especially in these last few months that have, have been so difficult in our own country, is that that I had this sense? Um, I had this sense that God was was so present there, and part partly it was because that people were just praying all the time, and so it was it was like I was wrapped in prayer constantly. I mean, we we would pray before we got in the car. We would I mean, just pray throughout the day loudly in groups, you know, <laughs> and and it was it was so it was so transformative to just be kind of surrounded by that blanket of prayer. Um, and to and to really palpably feel feel God's presence and, and not in a way of you know sometimes people say like oh I feel that God's protecting me I didn't feel that I was being protected from harm because of course I knew wonderful people who who died or who um, you know terrible things happened to so so I didn't have that sense that God stops terrible things from happening necessarily um, but it, but it was more just that I felt that God was was with us um, and and was there present no, no matter what happened. Um, almost like uh, I use the, the, the phrase of a, the, to, to travel in the wake of angels um, that had had that sense that, um, that that that's always there, but I was more aware of it uh, because of the people that I was with were more aware of it. And they taught me to be more aware of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, oh, Cindy, yes. Yeah. <laughs> how did you learn how to uh, do agriculture in that part of the world? So, um, so I had already, I lived in Liberia in West Africa for, for a year, which uh, even though the climate was, was different, it was a hot tropical equatorial climate. Um, before I went to Liberia, I studied at an institute in Florida that, that has a demonstration farm and they, they specialize in techniques for subsistence farmers. They were started by a group of Christians who were scientists in agriculture and who felt that um, that it was their duty to to use the knowledge that they had to help the poorest people in the world. And um, so all of their techniques, like I mentioned, they don't they're not about, you know, bringing in an expensive seed or an expensive fertilizer or something that's not sustainable. But literally, you know, what can people have what can people do just with increased labor, just with the with the resources that they have available to them already? Um, so everything that I did was um, was based on that idea of sustainability and um, and improving improving the environment because of course a, a soil that's healthy um, gives a gives a much larger um, crop as well and so so everything was was about kind of that that restoration of health um, and that includes in in the human heart so 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 many of the farmers you know who had been through war they didn't think very highly of themselves anymore you know they had they'd been passed over for a scholarship or for a business loan and they were stuck being farmers and it felt like they had failed. And, um, and if the failure wasn't enough, there was the being driven from their land during the war and all those things. And, um, and so we, we would just spend time in Bible study and look at the passages and say, you know, the first calling of humanity is to be caretakers of the land. It's right there in Genesis. You know, what does that mean to you? And people would start explaining um, their stories and their experience. And um, you'd see the, the kind of the spark just grow in the room as people really wrestled with this idea of, 
of being chosen by God to be caretakers of the earth and the importance of that role. And, and it was really from that place of claiming their own value before God and their own um, importance in society because of that, that, that people were able to find the, um, the, the, the courage and the, and the effort and the energy that it was gonna take to implement these new techniques, which a lot of which required a lot of extra work um, in order to, to do something differently. So um, you, you can see that was how I started to, started to get interested in the, in the transformation piece and how it is that, that faith motivates and changes us. Um, so it seems like these are two very different careers, but for me, they're, they're very much connected. Now, the crops that they, they uh, produced, did they, was that used on a continuing basis, or did they have uh, crops that they would store in a, in a, or transfer, transport to another part of the country, or is there anything like that going on? <clears throat> um, yeah, so, so in certain parts of the country where there was a, a supply chain in place, you could, you could buy seeds. I mean, other places you would have to, you'd have to save your own seeds from your crop from the previous year and, and keep those seeds safe and dry and free of pests. Yeah. And then of course, some, some plants are, are propagated vegetatively uh, like cassava. Um, so you would, you would cut the stems and, and save the stems and then plant them. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a farmer's daughter too. So <laughs> a wheat farmer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any other any other questions? Robin, our our son spent uh, uh, a term in uh, two terms in Kenya. One of which he and another girl were in teaching uh, about two hours outside of Nairobi in a small little village, uh, English and uh, math. And his uh, comment was, "A, you could put a stick in the ground and it would grow. It was remarkably <laughs> fertile. B." that only the women would be working the fields. And it wasn't as though they were at war, the men would just be lazing around, but it was the women who were <laughs> doing the work. Did you find any of that? <laughs> well, it, it, depends on, it, it depends entirely on where you are. So, you know, I had the great honor of, of visiting the entire country of South Sudan. So, so I visited every single state, every single diocese. Um, so I was able to see just the incredible diversity of, of traditions and ethnic groups that were present. So, um, you know, in some places there'd be really defined roles and it would be certain crops men would grow and certain crops women would grow. And um, in other places, the men only took care of the livestock and the women did the crops. Um, so it was re really just depended from, from, place, from place to place um, what, it was, what it was that was going on. And, and like I said, you know, it's, it's a unique place because women were also clergy. So there was, you know, certainly... Um, there was, a, I think, a sense of, of um, at least in the church, you know, of, of the importance of, of women's work, you know, whether that was in ministry or, um, or on the farms or, or wherever it was. Any, any last questions? It, it, yes, Mary. <laughs> it was pretty exciting to see that overcrowded church. And I, it made me think of John Lewis saying that he got into good trouble. Well, that overcrowded yeah. church looked like a good problem. <laughs> I wish you yes. had it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm pretty sure once, once the pandemic is, is gone, we're going we're gonna to feel pretty crowded <laughs> in our church too. Um, there's something about, um, I, I just think the, the joy, especially uh, of a community that has been tempered by, by great difficulty and sorrow, the, the incredible joy of, of being able to, to be together and to, um, to pray and to sing together. Um, and, and it isn't just, you know, it isn't just a simple story of, of triumph. You know, there, there's a lot of, of difficulty along the way and a lot of, of back and forth and, and infighting. And even in the church, you know, it, it's never just a, a simple story. Um, but but one of, of real resilience and determination to, um, to cling, cling tight to the light of God and, and the power of, of Jesus at work in the community. And, um, and I just really, really saw that in my time there um, in, in amazing ways, uh, the power of Christ. And, and I am convinced, I continue to be convinced that, uh, that Christ is not more powerful in South Sudan <laughs> just because it's South Sudan. You know, that, um, that, that that same power of Christ that we all have access to who, who are his followers. And, um, 
Uh, so, and that's, that was really the heart of, of why I felt called back to, back to California um, after, after I left. So I wanted to stay actually, but, but I had this strong sense of, of being called back to my own context um, with this, with this new understanding and, and new, new eyes to see God at work. So, um, so I'm very happy to be planted among you. And, uh, and <laughs> it's really too. fun to be we able are to. We too, Robin. We are too. <laughs> to, <laughs> It's really fun to be able to tell you this story, which is um, such an important part of um, of my life. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah, right. Very interesting. Robin. Thank you. Thank you, Robin. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.